my main mantra these days is find the others. You don't have to do this in isolation. Just look into people's eyes and you'll get that instant moment of recognition of, oh, there's another one. Let's do this together. Welcome to What Could Possibly Go Right, a project of the Post Carbon Institute. We interview cultural scouts, people who see far and serve others to help us all see more clearly so we can act more courageously in really messy times. I'm Vicki Robin, your host. Today, I get to introduce you to Douglas Rushkoff. He and I have both been longtime critics of consumerism in our society. And we, we, all, we both like to stand outside of society's assumptions to ask if where we're headed is where we wanna go. In this interview though, I found the most important alignment between myself and Douglas. He's a Lanceman, a member of the tribe, meaning we are both Jewish, which means we are sort of smart, funny, clever, and a bit ironic, which you will notice here. We had a lot of fun. Named one of the world's most 10 most influential intellectuals by MIT, Douglas is an author and documentarian who studies human autonomy in a digital age. His 20 books include Team Human, based on his podcast, as well as bestsellers, Present Shock, Throwing Rocks at the Google Bus, and Program or Pre Be Programmed, and Life Inc. Uh, he also made the PBS Frontline documentaries, Generation Like, uh, the Persuaders and Merchants of Cool. He coined the concepts like viral media, screenagers, and social currency, and has been a leading voice for applying digital media towards social and economic justice. He is also a columnist, a medium. So enjoy, Douglas Rushkoff. Hey, well, Douglas, welcome to What Could Possibly Go Right? Good to be with you. Uh, yeah, this is like cultural scouts, people with long histories as visionaries and activists. We ask you to peer into the murk of the moment and put on your headlamp and help us see more clearly so we can act more courageously. And uh, I've been watching your videos and have read Team Human. Mm. And I feel like we've been barking up the same tree or sniffing the same trail <laughs> uh, for many years. Um, and, and you, like me, have followed many innovations with sort of a great deal of optimism about what they could do for humanity and, and sort of a great sorrow <laughs> for, you know, how our worst angels just grab them and take them over. Um, but here we are. And, and you and I are both still asking, what's the core question for a series, which is uh, what could possibly go right? Go right even now, 2020, bad collective trip of the highest order, you know, the pandemic, the, the social justice uprising, the recession, polarization. And yet, once again, we ask the question, what could possibly go right? Take it away. Well, and what I've been thinking a lot about during this whole pandemic moment and the forced uh, immersion in all of these networking technologies as a substitute for whatever it was we used to do. Um, I got reminded of the time when I was, uh, I was in maybe 10th grade and my father found a pack of Marlboro lights in my jacket pocket. And I thought, Oh, he's going to punish me. He's going to punish me. And he's like, meet me in the backyard after dinner. So we have dinner and I think, what's he going to do? Is he going to hit me? What's going to happen? Takes me to the backyard. He's got my cigarettes in his hand. He says, so you want to smoke? Start. And he made me smoke the whole friggin' pack of cigarettes. So by the time I'm like at the third, third or fourth cigarette, I start getting all green and I get sick and I throw up my dinner and it's just, it's a mess. And I feel like that's where we're at with technology right now, that that the gods have said, oh, you people, you really want to meet on Zoom? You really want to talk to everybody through FaceTime? You really want to text all the time? Okay, here you go. And it's like they took us to the back porch 
the way my dad did and said, all right, here, now eat this 24 seven and see how you like that. And that people are so sick of this stuff. They're so nauseous. They're so overwhelmed. They're so uh, uh, fully sensorily aware of this assault of, of prana free exchange of soulless encounters of people saying they agree with you, but you aren't in the same space with them. Your body can't feel it. You can't see if their pupils are getting larger, if their breathing is sinking up to yours. The mirror neurons don't fire. The oxytocin doesn't go through your bloodstream. You get off the call and you know in your head, the person says they agreed with me, but your body doesn't feel it. And all that does is engender more distrust. They say they agreed, but all the, the 600, 800,000 years of painstakingly evolved social mechanisms for gauging trust and veracity with other people are just thwarted in these spaces. And we feel increasingly untethered from everything, from, from reality itself. We don't even know. It's not just Facebook and algorithms and these guys, these, these, these kids at these companies are vastly overestimating their power over human cognition and the psyche. You know, this is just what happens when you have nothing, when you're untethered, when you don't have organic um, kinship. So what could possibly go right is we emerge from this uh, isolation um, desperate to connect with other people in real ways, uh, no longer content to walk down the street as we did a year ago with everybody staring into their phones, doing texting instead of looking at who else is in the street, you know, more willing to make eye contact and establish rapport. And once you've established rapport, you've got the precursor to solidarity. And once you have solidarity, then you become open to things like uh, mutual aid and mutuality instead of capitalism and extraction. You realize that, that the world is not a dangerous place, that you need to earn enough money to insulate yourself from it but that you could spend all of this energy making the world a place that you don't feel the need to isolate yourself from. You know, meet your neighbors, take care of them. You take care and feel responsible even if you don't like them. It doesn't even matter if you like people. You know, I was raised in the Marlo Thomas, free to be you and me, you know, hands across the world, Rodney King, can't we all just get along understanding of civics? You know, screw that. You know, it's almost, we, we, we should, protect those we don't like. Civics is about feeling responsible for people. It's easy to feel responsible for my daughter. It's much harder to feel responsible for the asshole down the block with the Trump sign, but we're responsible for him too. And that's the kind of thing that could be engendered if we start looking at people in real life rather than through these, these ridiculous filters, through these platforms that are designed to make us hate each other. So what could possibly go right is as we step outside and breathe the air and walk the ground and see the others, we realize that that's what we have to protect, that the object of the game is not to create a digital womb around us with algorithms that can predict our every want and need the way our mothers couldn't when we were babies, but rather um, to engage in the, the, the living, messy, chaotic reality that is life and start to see everything as teeming with, with fertility and messiness and soft, squishy things. You know, what could possibly go right is that we finally break free of that kind of late medieval renaissance understanding of science and technology as ways, like Francis Bacon said, a way to grab nature by the forelock, hold her down and submit her to our will. You know, we can actually break free of our rape fantasy for how to deal with nature and women and life and others and dark forests and the soil and the moon and realize, oh my gosh, this stuff is all friendly. 
this is our our nourishment this is uh um boy it's it's like like eating a juicy piece of fruit it's alive and so filled with possibility you know that will stop trying to reduce the unpredictability of everything and everyone around us and learn to see that unpredictability as the the novelty and weirdness and joy of being a living entity uh, in the now. Yeah, so if you were making book on that happening. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, and I don't mean to like, I, I'm the one who's supposed to be saying what could possibly Yeah, you asked the question. <laughs> yeah, I asked the question. But where do you see evidence? I'm asking you to be sort of, you know, scientific, but where do you see evidence in the now of that possibility, you know, of us emerging into that light and not emerging into a greater ineptitude? Do you see bubbling up someplace this possibility? Because I could, couldn't could agree with you more. That is what I have been working my whole life for, mm -hmm. that juicy thing. Um, and I'm a stand for it and you're a stand for it, but where do you see evidence now? Who else do we need? <laughs> <laughs> right. Takes two. Um, no, I see it everywhere. I mean, the way, the way right now, the way I get to see it is I write an article on Medium espousing these ideas and they become, you know, a million people read it and clap on it and comment on it my inbox of a thousand emails a day is a sign that people are looking for ways to do that. The, the, the listenership of my podcast, which is up to like 50,000 people for something that's got no ads and promotion. There is a groundswell. The, the projects I see out of, you know, not Silicon Valley, but out of Detroit, out of New Zealand, out of Africa, in India, there are mutual favor banks and local currencies and uh, people uh, creating commons-based beehive networks and, you know, everywhere. I mean, if, if you're open to seeing it, I kind of see it everywhere. I mean, there's some trailheads, you know, the, the women who do Zebras Unite. Uh, it's like, oh, wow, here's a whole new range of businesses. Uh, Trevor Schultz with the Platform Cooperative Movement, uh, creating or helping to facilitate the creation of worker-owned businesses. Um, the Inspiral Network in uh, New Zealand, who have all these different apps and uh, uh, sort of organizational modalities that they're sharing with the world for how to start uh, uh, community-supported agriculture and delivery services and uh, 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 local currencies and uh, gift economies. So I, I am seeing it and I'm seeing it um, amongst the young, you know, who so, at least in America, so traumatized by uh, uh, shooter alerts and uh, God knows what they, they have to go through. And now, I mean, with COVID and masks and shields at the same time, they still have to do their shooter, their shooter drills while they're in surgical masks. I mean, what are they thinking? I'll tell you what they're thinking is this is bull. You know, this does not work. This is not the future that, that we want to live. They've got a, not a seriousness, but a practicality. I feel it's not, you know, we like to say, or so many adults like to say they're lost in Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and all that. I don't see that. I see very hands on, a very hands on generation of kids who are willing to do what's necessary to dig themselves out of the mess that we in prior generations have, have put them in. So now I see it, you know, pretty much everywhere. I see it in the the radically fearful reaction of the alt-right to women's empowerment, to the, the climate movement, to the uh, uh, increase in intimacy that is, is taking place all around them. I see that as like the last 
fundamentalist kind of gasp of this uh, you know mythology of nation state and and boundary and i see some positivity in this right wing insanity you know what what's clever about a man like trump saying do not fear this virus do not fear this virus and then you see the whole left saying oh no we have to fear it we have to fear it they played right and we don't have to fear you don't have to fear it even if you have cancer you don't have to fear it right you fight it i'm not afraid of the virus i'm smart about the virus there's a difference so even they who are realizing wait a minute some of the ways that we're looking at um at at social justice some of the ways we're looking at you know universal rights seem to be based in uh um in some sort of self-defeating, um, even even counterintuitively repressive strategies. And they're looking to try to, wait a minute, can't we do this all through enhancement rather than pushing something down? And yeah, that is the way you do it. It's not always by yelling at people that they're doing the wrong thing, but helping them figure out how to transform what they're doing into something positive. You know, any therapist will tell you that. You can't take away a behavior without replacing it with something even juicier. You know, and that's that's not through fear or scolding. That's through seduction. Uh, we're both being counter-tribal, so I'll just say that I love <laughs> what you just said because um, I've been hanging out with some people who are into, into QAnon and, and libertarians. I'm, you know, I'm just very curious because, because we look at each other like alien species, mm -hmm. but I've decided to actually do my research, you know, and, and I am finding that one of the appeals of the, um, the, the, the Trump narrative is this optimism is this, you know, like everything, you know, you listen to him and, and, and to us, he sounds like insane. This thing is not going away by the summer. You know, we know that, you know, but he says that because he, he thinks that optimism is a, a way you get through things. But that's you know? his, that's his upbringing. He was raised in the church. He went to the church of Norman Vincent Peale. Exactly. Who wrote exactly. the power of positive thinking and came right out of the theosophy movement of, you know, Mary Baker Eddy and Christian science and Madame Blavatsky. This right. is like the secret. Think it, be it, get it, you know, whatever you, and there is a certain something refreshing about that and yeah. it doesn't have to be against the science it's like bernie siegel the cancer doctor he would right. do the surgery but also have the person envision sure. the the cancer dying it's like you don't you get you could have both you're not just not just one yeah it's in a way it's in a way the the polarization is actually driving us into greater positionality because you just can't give the other side not a centimeter, not even an inch, you know, because- Without getting attacked by your own side. It's like, I say something like that to say, look, Trump was really smart about this, or, or we, have to, we have to embrace aspects of, oh, how could you do that? You're a, a, a collaborator with the fascists and the Nazis. And it's like, no, I'm not saying Hitler was good. That's not what I'm saying. Right, you know? right, right. Yeah, it's not, you know, both sides have a point. It's, it's that there is a- a, just a minorly transcendent state in which you observe what's possible. This is the whole interview. You know, what's possible in the moment and what's laying, what are the ideas laying around that we can cobble together into something fresh, you know? So I don't want to go, go no, off on No, it's good though, that. but yeah, I like what you're asking though. It's sort of what are the, the sleeper cells of positive action? Totally, exactly. Yeah. What are the sleeper cells? And, um, you know, you brought up a lot of things um, that are about cooperatives and collaboratives and sharing networks, etc. And I have also looked into that a great deal in the past, tried to create an alternative currency where I am. And, you know, it's just very clear that that as long as the dollar is strong, you know, people are not going to trade massages, you know, so, um, but it's places where the the dominant way to meet your needs has failed you. People is spontaneously, this isn't like in Argentina, you know, it's like spontaneously block by block there were currencies, there's trading systems. And in a way, 
what could possibly go right? I know I'm answering my own question, but you asked to have a dialogue, you know, is that the failure of the system that we live inside of, that we look to provide us with, you know, baseline survival and meaning, the failure is getting up more and more obvious, you know, it starts with toilet paper and it just goes down <laughs> from there, you know? Um, so that in a way, the failure itself could be part of what goes right because then the innovation from below faced with the necessity of living your life. And I am, I am no way extolling poverty, but everything you mentioned comes from someplace outside of, of the people who have enough money to sort of cover the territory. I read a book uh, recently that the title I forgot, but it's about um, black cooperative economics, history of black cooperative economics in uh, America since the 1700s. And basically because they were disenfranchised, because they were slaves, because they couldn't participate in the real economy or in our real economy, um, black people created uh, circular economics and cooperatives and mutual aid societies before we white folk even knew what they were. And their communities would become so wealthy, right? That, that the neighboring white communities would then go in and tear them apart. That's why they rioted and killed all those people. It's like, wait a minute, we cut you off. You're not allowed to be richer than us if we cut you off. How did this happen? And it's because they were employing the kinds of mechanisms that we're talking about here, because they had to. So then you look at our society and, and I like you sometimes think, boy, if the 2007 crash wasn't enough to do it, how bad a crash are we gonna need to get people to start turning toward these much more cooperative, healthy, commons-based economic solutions? And you almost get into what, what I think they call it accelerationism, where you want, the, you want capitalism to burn itself out so that these other things can happen. But it's such a violent way for it to happen, you know? Do we need another great depression for people in the wasteland to start? You know, that's the last time we had thriving alternative currencies in this country, was in the, in the early 1930s. And it's like, do we have to go there? And I'm hoping we don't. I'm hoping we don't have to hit bottom to get off our addiction to exponential growth and extraction and, and uh, uh, repression of others, but we may, we may. It right. feels like that's the only way people learn unless we can somehow make the commons look and feel so much more appealing, so much more fun. In other words, rather than using the stick of, of devastation, if we can use the carrot of sexy, weird, <laughs> wet fun, you know, to seduce people into enjoying each other rather than competing against each other, you know, we may stand a chance. And I think the path toward that is to make people more aware of the spiritual deficit that we're under, mm -hmm. which really precedes the economic deficit. It's this, it's this, 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 sense of loss and isolation and despair that so many people have. It's the canaries in the coal mine of teen suicide and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and cutting and all this. It's like, if you can't see that and realize, wow, maybe we need to take a different approach, you know, and COVID could do that. When I hear a lot of parents saying, you know, I don't care about what college my kid gets into anymore. I just want to get, I want them just to get to go. I just want them to get to be there, you know, and that's like, good, you know, mm. good, because really doesn't matter. It really, I mean, I've taught it a bunch. It really doesn't matter where you go. There's good teachers and assholes in every one of these places, right. you know? Yeah. It's sort of like one of the things that I see is, is just even where we are, the, the formality of being in a TV studio, forget that, you know, we're in our homes and behind this screen, you would not believe what's behind the screen, <laughs> you know, so, so there is an informality um, and a leveling of, of prestige at least. Um, 
Yeah, one other thing I'll say, and we should probably wind up, is um, that I think piece of what you're pointing to also in all these sort of cooperative ventures is proximity. Mm. You know, we talk, we, we've lost a sense that proximity, we live somewhere and we live around some people. And there, so there's an abstraction of community that comes from being online or doing yeah. this, you know, but there's a concrete reality of living somewhere. And then you do form the cooperative systems. There is a, the sort of underground volunteer economy of giving and receiving is immense when you're in a communities where you trust each other because you shop at the same market and you, you know, your kids go to play dates and whatever. Right. Uh, right. And you see the fact that, Oh, if I'm spending my money in town, then my tax, the tax base goes up, the schools get better. My main street's happier. You know, if you don't, then you see the empty stores on your main street and you're, right. you're, you're, real estate values go down. It's like, it's, it's self, it's a, it's a selfish spiral, but you're, you're like me, you're really arguing for localism, you know, for, for, it's funny. Cause whenever I talk about localism and proximity and all that at this sort of conferences that I get to speak at, someone always gets up and says, well, yeah, but how does that scale? <laughs> It scales sideways. Yeah, That's exactly. the thing. It scales. It doesn't scale up. It scales sideways, and and we could have a whole other conversation. I just feel like I, I'm I'm having to cut this off because I'm committed to our listeners that yes, you know they get a a, a, a soupçon. You know they get a taste, but they're not going to have to be like on an hour and a half YouTube something. Right. So. Um, but we could go off on a whole other thing and maybe we should as another time. Maybe you're the one person I'm going to revisit because uh, localism, you know, the being able to travel electronically, but live locally, I think there's a great potential there. And maybe this moment is sort of squeezing down some of the, um, some of the abstraction of self, mm. you know, and, and so that we're becoming more ourselves in our natural habitat and our homes um, and being able to do some of our business without getting on airplanes, you know? So yeah, I, I can see, you know, there's what I feel from, from our conversation, it, our riffing is that there are so many ways to see this. This is not a, a it, it's a very hard time, but it's not a dour time right. of, the end times. I mean, it can be end times. We could go there, but it has so many sparkling possibilities around the edges that if we just look there and um, feel a little bit excited about it, even that'd be cool. Yeah, so, wouldn't it? Yeah. Do you have like one final great thing you want to say to us before we close out? Um, my main mantra these days is find the others. You know, just find the others that don't, you don't have to do this in isolation. They're out there. They're all over the place. Just look into people's eyes and you'll get that instant moment of recognition of, Oh, there's another one. There's a, let's do this. Let's do this together. Right. Well, thank you so much for a really fun conversation. Oh, thank you. And uh, so know how we should continue this is I should have you on uh, team human. So then we can have an hour long conversation. Okay. okay? Hey, thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a five-star review, which will help this hopeful message get out to more people. And check out the Post Carbon Institute website for show notes and for more guest information. Thanks to all our donors for their support. Thanks also to Cher Miller, Amy Boringrud, and Clara Winter at Post Carbon Institute, plus production assistant Michelle Wig from frugalityandfreedom.com. 